Okay, um, we all know that there's been a, um, a big decline in the supply of high quality accountability journalism or investigative journalism or watchdog journalism, whatever you want to call it. And this can be looked at from a perspective uh, of, an, of an economist as being a pricing problem. Uh, this kind of journalism is costly, as we heard today. Uh, it's never been uh, priced in a, in a true market, uh, a true economic market, because it's always been subsidized by advertising, or in some countries it's been uh, subsidized by tax money. So uh, is it a public good, like streetlights, and should the public sector fund it, should government fund it, or uh, is it really a commercial product? And publishers and the government and, uh, uh, and the public themselves are all really kind of negotiating uh, in the marketplace right now to uh, set a price for this journalism. I come at this from uh, two sides. <clears throat> I was a reporter, editor, investigative team leader for many years, and then I went to the dark side as a publisher, yeah, um, where I was in charge of advertising, marketing, and so I've seen this issue from, from both sides. <clears throat> you could make a strong uh, economic argument for investigative journalism by saying it has a great return on investment. Um, and Dave Kaplan of the uh, Global Investigative Journalism Network has made precisely that argument <clears throat> by saying that it, uh, this kind of journalism has resulted in billions of recovered tax money and uh, from also from fines from wrongdoers. So the question is, you know, who's going to pay for this? And how much will they pay for it? So uh, this was from the uh, good old days when there was a monopoly in the newspaper and uh, the ads in the, in the newspaper paid for these big staffs where you could have investigative journalism done. But <clears throat> that model's gone away. And now uh, this is the way people get news on their mobile devices. And more importantly, uh, this is where the advertising has gone <clears throat> that used to support uh, uh, watchdog journalism. This slide really kind of uh, captures the whole argument, I think. Um, that ad was delivered by a service that knows that this guy doesn't have a shoe. Uh, and it knows that, it, that he doesn't have a shoe because he's got a, uh, a smartphone in his pocket uh, so it knows who he is, and it knows that he posted on Facebook that he's missing a shoe, and it knows that he searched on Google to, for a good place to buy shoes. And so that advertising is not in the newspaper that's in his lap, because these two uh, know more about this guy <clears throat> than the newspaper does. Uh, so they, they dominate global advertising, uh, mobile advertising, they got more than half, and these two combined have about 40% of all digital advertising uh, uh, globally. So uh, part of what you use to establish a price is metrics. And you heard a number of people today say, uh, internet metrics, there's lots of flaws, there's lots of problems. Tony Hale of Chartbeat wrote a very famous article in Time Magazine Everything you think you know about the web is wrong. And one of the main things that's wrong is page views. Page views really are kind of a meaningless metric. Everybody uses them. We all use them. But um, out of 2 billion uh, visits to hundreds of websites, 55% of the visits lasted less than 15 seconds. This is from his company's surveys of people, uh, his clients, hundreds of his clients. And uh, Pew Research backs them up. Pew Research found that um, the average, uh, that only 12% of the users uh, of the New York Times, or the visitors to the New York Times, spend more than two minutes a day. Only 12% of the New York Times users spend more than two minutes a day. Uh, how much time are they spending on Facebook? Then they've got digital media face, other kinds of problems, piracy, bots, 
ad blockers. You heard a lot, a lot about that today. But there's good news. Um, as we heard, the uh, International Consortium of Inve Investigative Journalists did this great investigation of Swiss leaks. Journalists from 45 countries, they found that uh, a Swiss bank, HSBC, was helping its clients commit uh, crimes, uh, illegal acts. And then the same organization, ICIJ, as we all know, followed up with the Panama Papers, and they used this concept of radical sharing among investigative journalists. And the response of the public has been huge, as we heard, uh, millions of page views. So obviously there's an audience for investigative journalism. The public appreciates it, really appreciates it, when it's well done and when it's relevant. Uh, and so there is a marketplace. So how much will the public pay? Well, it depends on where you live. If you look at the top line, that's Finland. And if you change this to dollars, they're spending about uh, $140 per person per year, at least that was in 2008, uh, to uh, fund journalism, to fund the media. Uh, if you look at Great Britain down there, uh, their total is about $90 per person per year to subsidize journalism. And that's a, basically a price. And if you look at the bottom there, it's the United States. And in the United States, we uh, commit about $6 a year per person. Um, for, and that includes postal rate uh, subsidies, tax breaks on um, uh, single copy sales, and also, um, uh, what else? Oh, that's public TV and public radio too. So you can see how our, in our culture, how we value or what the price is that we pay on public subsidies for journalism. Um, as Joel was saying, every, uh, every culture uh, values it differently. And now we have something called distributed content, which you heard a lot about today. The Wall Street Journal is on Snapchat. I mean, need we say more? Um, Wall Street Journal and um, all the big media have decided that they're going in for distributed content with Facebook, Google, Snapchat, Instagram, Apple News, et cetera. Uh, they're going for scale. They're going for scale. And uh, they're going to get faster load times. They're going to get a little bit of money. Uh, it extends their reach to new audiences, uh, but it dilutes the importance of their websites. There's this disconnect between their brand and, and their content, and that's the price that they're paying. So you can go for scale, and you can go for eyeballs, like uh, <coughs> BuzzFeed is doing, or you can go for engagement, relationships, and create community, which is what the Texas Tribune is doing. And on the local level, uh, as we heard today, uh, local investigative journalism does not scale. It does not scale. You can't use that model. You have to go for relationships, create community, not eyeballs. And uh, a great example of that is El Diario.es in Spain. Uh, they managed to get 14,500 people um, to pay $66 a year for a free product. And their, uh, their value proposition is, we're editorially independent. We're free from the influence of all the big business interests and uh, political parties. And that represents $800,000 for them, which is a significant part of their budget. But it's also interesting that it's only 1% of their audience, or actually less than 1%. Uh, so you can make a business out of uh, monetizing a very small part of your total audience. The Correspondent in Holland, similar. They had a big crowdfunding. Now they have 40,000 people paying uh, also $66 a year. Um, and their ad uh, value proposition is no ads, also editorial independence, uh, and it's investigative journalism. Malaysia Kini in Malaysia launched in 1999. They publish in four languages, but they only charge a subscription price to the English users uh, so that they get nine million visitors a month. But again, they, only a very small part of their audience is paying for the uh, online news, but it's enough to help them uh, support their operation. 
And we have this uh, great small group of uh, investigative journalists, uh, data journalists in Mexico. It's called Quien, Quien Compro. And Quien Compro does exposés on the expenses of senators in Congress. Um, and they syndicate their stuff. They syndicate it to uh, bigger media organizations. Uh, so the bigger media organizations, which aren't doing this kind of investigative journalism, they value it enough to pay them sometimes. So should uh, uh, you all charge for online news? Well, um, the Reuters study, 50, 2015 study, Reuters Institute, <clears throat> they asked people in four countries, you know, would you pay for digital news at any price? And the bad news is that anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths said, we wouldn't pay for digital news at any price. But what's kind of interesting is when you dig into these numbers a little bit, you can see that uh, anywhere from 10 to 25% of the people polled said, we would pay 250 to five bucks a month, uh, relatively speaking, in their various countries for uh, digital news, and more importantly, 10% in all their survey, in all the, all the developed countries, 10% of the uh, people polled are paying for digital news. Uh, Piano Media is this uh, paywall organization that used to be Press Plus in the US, and they combined with Piano, and then they merged with Tiny Pass, and now they represent 1,200 news organizations on four continents, and just taking their share of the paywall revenue, they made 40 million last year. How much are these uh, users paying? What's the price? Uh, not really clear. Uh, if you look for look at some of these pay models or the uh, packages that, for example, the Times and the Wall Street Journal, I was a subscriber to both of these, um, when they offer you a print and digital package, it's you paid so much for this, and then if you want the pad, iPad, and if you want the iPad and the iPhone, you know, there's different packages. They try to mix and match. It's actually very confusing, but what they want is they want you to pay for the digital like you used to pay for the print, and they want you to get the print so that they can claim that for their advertisers. And finally, the last example is Blendle, which, um, has been very successful so far in, in Germany and Holland. They have 600 users. This is the iTunes for news where you just pay f per article, around 20 cents to a dollar per article. Um, their pitch in the US, they, they just launched in the US like two weeks ago or something, has been uh, no ads, no clickbait, and they've gotten a big investment from the New York Times and Axel Springer. So. Who's going to pay for accountability journalism, and how much are they going to pay? Well, one solution is public subsidies, as we saw. Another is nonprofits, grants, local media for public radio, the relationship model, which has one kind of pricing method, the subscription model, paywalls, uh, and Blendle. So people will pay for digital news. So there's. There's a commercial, uh, at the moment, we, we have a commercial solution and we have the public sector tax-funded solution. Um, and they both seem to be working. And, the, and right now, the marketplace is trying to figure out what is the right price. So, uh, the right price, sometimes it isn't enough. And uh, if you want to talk more about that, why don't you come to Pamplona and we'll uh, talk it over.